I have the stereotypical New York City Italian mother. Do you have a picture of that? You know what that's like? Well, every time I take my mother out to dinner, I brace myself for the experience because it is an experience. When we go to restaurants, my mother views a restaurant as an extension of her kitchen and she acts accordingly. As we're being led to the table, our table in the restaurant, by the hostess, my mother walks by every table and greets people. Hi, how you doing? Hope you're enjoying yourself. That looks good. What are you eating? And, and she starts these conversations. Any poor person who has the misfortune of maintaining eye contact with her, forget about it. She'll stop there and she'll say, uh, you're here for a special occasion and carry on a conversation. Me, I silently look at the hostess and say, seat me now, please. But anyway, my mother carries on this conversation. Are you here for a special occasion? Oh, it's your birthday? How old are you? No question, no matter how personal, is, you know, off the record for my mother. She will ask it. So she'll find out how old somebody is, 40 years old. She'll pick up his glass, a fork, bang on it for the whole restaurant. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hey, put down your fork. 40th birthday over here. And she leads the whole restaurant in a song of happy birthday. Well, eventually my mother comes to the table where I am. We get our food, we're eating, and another poor couple was seated next to us, in the table next to us. And of course, you know, my mother greets them, starts talking to them. They get their menu, they're looking at the menu. My mother says, what are you thinking about ordering? Person said, I'm thinking about chicken parmesan. My mother said, oh, good choice. I ordered it, that's what I have. It is good. Now, not as good as I make it at home, but it's good. Look, I want to make sure you enjoy yourself tonight. She cuts off a piece, walks over there with it on her fork, and forces this guy to eat it. Well, you can just imagine the buzz in the audience. Uh, the audience of all these diners in this restaurant. I mean, it was her audience. It was unbelievable. Now, by the way, if you were there in that restaurant, and my mother came up to your table and had this kind of conversation, how many of you would have actually enjoyed it? Can I see your hands? Wow, that many Italians. <laughs> how many would have felt a little bit uncomfortable? Can I see your hands? A little bit uncomfortable, all right? Now, it doesn't matter. My mother's going to come up to your table and talk to you no matter whether you feel comfortable or not. And here's why. My mother religiously practices the golden rule. Now, before I go any further, let's make sure that all of us are on the same page. Anybody, what is the golden rule? What is it? All right. Little dissonance here. I'm hearing different versions of the golden rule, which I always do, by the way. You would think everybody would get it just like this. How many of you are managers in here? You manage other people. Can I see your hands? All right, well, that's one of the problems. <laughs> no, because usually when I get a lot of managers, I often hear their version of the golden rule, which is the person who has the gold makes the rules. But there's other versions floating around. Me, I was born and raised right in Manhattan, right in New York City. And as I was growing up, we had our version of the golden rule, do unto others before they do unto you. Yeah, and remember that. As a teenager, we moved to Jersey only to find out they had their variation, do unto others and split. But the real golden rule taught to us since childhood is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is that pretty accurate? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, I have to tell you, I believe in that rule 110%, especially when it comes to values, ethics, honesty, consideration. There's no better rule. But it can backfire. As I learned 
when I moved from the East Coast to San Diego. Different regional culture? Oh, yeah. Well, when I moved to San Diego, I practiced the golden rule. I treated people the way I wanted to be treated. I treated the San Diegans as if they were New Yorkers. <laughs> Do you see a potential problem here? Came on too strong, too aggressive, too in your face. Even when I ask people to do things that under any other circumstance they would have willingly done, they dug in their heels and decided not to do it. And it wasn't because of what I was asking them to do. It was simply because of how my approach. And it was then that I realized that I had to practice that age-old saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans. So, that's when I started developing this concept that I call the Platinum Rule. The Platinum Rule is simply a little twist on the Golden Rule. Platinum Rule, very simply stated, is do unto others as they want to be done unto. It's the New York version, but you get the point. Do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Treat people the way they want to be treated. In other words, talk to people in ways that make it easy for them to listen. Manage and lead people in ways that internally motivate them to want to follow. So, what I want to do today is share with you a concept. I know every single person in this room, everybody in this room, has been exposed to this concept at least one time. Some of you, several times. But how many of you, second, third time, through a book or a movie, heard or saw things the second or third time through that you totally missed first or second time. Has that ever happened to anybody? Same thing this morning. I honestly do not care how many times you've been exposed to this concept, how many times you've heard it. Even if you've heard it from me before, I guarantee you by the time I'm finished, by the time you leave this room, you will hear some new ideas, some new concepts, some new skills, some new techniques that will help you connect with people quicker, deeper, and longer lasting. And you will find that this works, this concept works just as well in your personal life as it does in your business. Now people won't tell you how to treat them. That would make things too easy, wouldn't it? Boy, if you want to get the most productivity out of me, this is exactly how you should manage me. You know, if you want to influence me, these are the things you should do. Follow these four steps. No, it doesn't happen that way. But what does happen is people will send out signals. Signals that you need to pick up. Signals that you need to use your eyes and ears and notice them and make sense of them. I'm not going to tell you signals that you haven't heard or seen before. All I'm going to do is take things you've heard and seen before, reorganize them in a way so that you could make some very positive, productive, significant decisions about how to treat people. Pay attention to three things when people communicate with you. The three things are their verbal, vocal, and visual communication. If we take 100% of the meaning somebody is trying to convey to another, it all comes across verbally, vocally, visually. I'm using all three right now. Whether I know it or not, whether I want to or not, I'm using all three. Verbally, the words that I use. So for instance, if we took this talk, recorded it, transcribed it, gave everybody a typed transcript of my talk, that would be the verbal and the verbal only. Let's say that we recorded this and gave everybody a CD or an MP3. That would be the verbal and the vocal, because now you would hear the way the words are spoken. How many of you believe that you would get more reading something as opposed to hearing it? How many would get more out of hearing it than reading it? Right, because there's so much more intent, not necessarily content, but intent in the vocal. And then the visual, everything from body language, facial expressions, image, all combine 
to convey 100% of the meaning of a message. And I will tell you this, the more emotional, the more personal, the more social the message, the more the meaning swings from verbal to vocal and visual. Now me, visual is a very critical aspect of my communication because I'm Italian. And you know Italians cannot speak without their hands. I've been told that our vocal cords are attached. I don't know. But, you know, we, we do all these gestures, you know, oh, you know, like this, or, you know, I, I won't go through some of the others, but, but you know what I mean. You watch that show, I won't name it, uh, that show on HBO. Two more episodes and it's over. But a lot of nonverbal. You see the nonverbal there. How about vocal? Do you realize the way a word is spoken can change the meaning or the interpretation over and over and over and over and over again? You know, I can say, hey, nice shirt. Or I can say, hey, nice shirt. Same words, different vocal, different meaning. Watch this. Take a simple word. It has no meaning until it is spoken, until it is vocalized. Watch how the meaning of it changes over and over and over again. Take the word O. Oh. No meaning until we say it. Now watch. The group. I'd like you to say the word O oh to convey I understand. One more time. I understand. I don't understand. Exact opposite. Surprise. Disappointment. Disgust. Affection. All right, one well, <clears throat> Now, I don't know who it was, but that was pleasure. I'm not him. That was pleasure. The wrong vocal can get you in trouble. All right, we're just looking for the verbal, the vocal, the visual signals that people send. And I'm going to ask you to make two simple decisions, ladies and gentlemen. The decisions are either or decisions. Two simple decisions. All right, let's go to our first slide here. First slide, all right, decision number one. Here we go. Is the person that I am communicating with through their verbal, vocal, visual communication exhibiting more open behaviors or more guarded behaviors? Now, how do you tell the difference? Open versus guarded. Well, guarded people, and by the way, as I go through this, think of people that you live with, that you socialize with, that you work with, who fit this description. Guarded people do not, <clears throat> and I repeat, they do not show or share their feelings and thoughts readily or willingly. In other words, they play their cards out. Close to the vest. Hard to read. Limited, controlled body language and facial expressions. To the extreme, we say they have what kind of a face? Poker face. These are the type of people that when they get together with you, they do not like much, if any, social talk, chit-chat, schmoozing, whatever you want to call it. What do they want you to do? Get to the point. Get down to business. Bottom line it. Cut to the chase. How many of you know somebody like that? I wonder if you know somebody like my, my buddy Dennis. Dennis is so guarded on the scale from one to four, he borders on zero. I'm serious. First time Dennis calls my home and my wife answers. This is what he said to her. She answers the phone. He says, Tony. That was it. Basically in that tone of voice, too. She hands me the phone. It's a short phone call. I get off the call. She said, who was that? I said, that was Dennis. Why? She said, Tony, I got to tell you, this guy has zero social skills. Unbelievable how rude he is. I said, Sue, it's Dennis. I mean, that's the way he is. I mean, he has a lot of positive things about him, but that's one of his shortcomings. She said, Tony, that's real bad for you. I said, hey, wh why me? What did I do? She said, Tony, you teach communication skills and relationship building, and you have a friend like this? 
What does it say to the world about the effectiveness of your techniques? <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, that was right between the eyes. She said, Tony, look, look, if I were you, I'm not asking you to give him up as a friend, but simply take him under your wing, do a little bit of personal coaching, one-on-one, -on -one, and show people how well your techniques work, how well the platinum rule works. Well, I took it as a challenge. I work with Dennis one-on-one, -on -one, personal coaching, 90 days. And I have to tell you, one of the more dramatic turnarounds in a person's behavior. Because in 90 short days, I mean, talk about dramatic. In 90 short days, he would call my house. My wife would answer. He would say, Sue, Dennis, Tony, 300% improvement. You don't get a lot better than that. This stuff works. By the way, guarded people make decisions primarily based on facts, logic, numbers, data, documentation. Put it in writing. Open people just the opposite. Open people readily and willingly show and share their feelings and thoughts, whether you want to know them or not. Good example, mom, my mother, all right? It's been said about open people, and this is especially true of my mother, that their thoughts are like gumballs. They just fall to the tongue and roll out. <laughs> Not unusual to leave a conversation with an open person and say to yourself, wow, woo -hoo -hoo! what did we talk about? Because they have a tendency to jump from one thing to another to another. They make decisions primarily based on what? Feelings, emotion, gut feel. And when they get together with you, they want to build the relationship first before moving into the task at hand or the objective or the purpose of the meeting. Now, I think I can go on and on, but I think you have the gist of how people are guarded, how people are open. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Do not, please, do not say this out loud. Do not ask anybody at your table. But here's the question. On this scale from one to four, guarded to open, what number would you pick for yourself? Pick a number that you believe reflects your pattern of behavior most of the time with most people. And by the way, because I'm with an audience that is constantly working with numbers and precision, I'm going to ask you a favor. Whole numbers only. Not a 2.5 or a 1.73. I'm not going to point, but I saw somebody pulling out a calculator. We're not going to get that precise. Just pick a whole number, one, two, three, or four. And I'll tell you, I know that there are some people out there asking this question. Well, should I pick the number I am at work or the number I am at home? Now, how many of you truly believe you have a different number or project a different number at work versus at home? Can I see your hands? All right, we call that schizophrenic. <laughs> Not really. Not really. Here is a key, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to notice the title of this slide. It says behavioral style. It does not say personality style. Personality, much more firmly ingrained. Many people believe a lot of the aspects of our personality are genetic. Personality hard to change. See, we're not talking about somebody changing their personality. We're talking about somebody changing their behavior. Now, can you change your behavior, work and home? Yeah. I mean, if you ask me, if you said, Tony, where are you on this scale? Are you more open or guarded? I would say, well, it depends. Are you talking about work or home? Because it's different. You say, well, what about work? I say, well, are you talking about how I am with my employees or my customers? Because it's different. You say, what about at home? Well, I'd ask with my wife or with my kids because it's different. You say, how about your kids? I'd say, which one? Because it's different. So you absolutely can have a different number at work or at home. I want you to focus 
one or the other, pick a number. How many of you are here sitting at a table with somebody you know? Can I see your hands? All right, quite a few people. So here's what we're going to do. 30 seconds, that is all. I will not speak during the 30 seconds, but when you hear my voice, please stop talking. Give me your attention back. But here's what I want you to do. Watch how interesting this is. I want you to lean over to somebody at your table. Ask that person, hey, where would you put me? And see how close their perception of your behavior is to yours. Go ahead, you got 30 seconds. 30 seconds. May I have your attention? 30 seconds are up. I have a quick question for you. How many of you, upon asking your colleague what number he or she would pick for you, they picked the exact same number as you picked for yourself? Let me see your hands. Excellent. Much higher than normal that, that I see. How many were one number off from what you chose for yourself and what they said for you? One number off. All right. How about two numbers off? Two. All right. How about three? because we're going to have a special session for you afterwards. <laughs> Nobody. All right. No special session. Ladies and gentlemen, decision number one. When we are dealing with people, all I want you to do, forget about the numbers now. All I want you to do is, based on what I see and what I hear, based on their verbal, vocal, visual behavior, is the person coming across more open or more guarded? Now, that's one. Number two. Is the person coming across more direct or indirect? Now, the beauty of this is it's two simple either or decisions that will lead you to one of these four colors. Now, how do you tell the difference between somebody being more direct or indirect? Well, indirect people are slower paced. Direct people, faster paced. Now, when I say slower and faster, I'm talking about the way they walk the way they talk, the way they make decisions, the way they do things in general. Indirect people slower, direct people faster. Indirect people less assertive, direct people more assertive. Indirect people more patient, direct people impatient. When it comes to risks, decisions, or change, indirect people approach all three more slowly, cautiously, and methodically, because indirect people have a tremendous inner driving need not to be wrong. And as a result, they tend to check, double check, think about it, sleep on it, do their homework, their research, their due diligence, because they don't want to be wrong. Direct people, when it comes to risks, decisions, and change, they approach all three more quickly, decisively, sometimes even spontaneously, because their inner driving need is to accomplish and achieve as much as possible, get it over with, what's next? I will tell you, when they work together, they can drive each other crazy. <laughs> Indirect people want to do things just right. Direct people, it's good enough. When it comes to rules, indirect people follow rules according to the letter of the law. Direct people follow rules according to the spirit of their interpretation. I love to watch people. That's where I get some of my great stories, just simply watching people in public places, especially. And for instance, checking into, let's say, a hotel, or in a bank line, or in an airline uh, uh, queue trying to check in. It really is amazing. I was watching this particular situation in a bank, and everybody's in this line, and they have one teller open. And yet there are two other tellers. I don't know what they're doing. They're sitting there. So I'm watching a direct person and an indirect person come to the end of the line. Let me tell you, nobody likes lines, but they handle it very different. An indirect person walks to the end of the line like this, a little slower, a little bit more reserved. They go like this. I don't believe this. My lunch hour. I got to be back in 15 minutes. 12, 14. I'm number, I'm number 16. If they take even one minute a person, I won't be back to work on time. I, I just can't understand it. Why would they have during lunchtime 
one window open. And there, there are two people right there doing nothing. I just cannot believe this. But everything is to themselves. It's like self-talk, right? But they are talking. Of course, a direct person, would they handle that differently? What do you think? Direct person, you can see just by the pace, right? They're walking like this. Oh, no. Oh, no. I don't believe this. Look at this. There must be 20 people in line here. I got 15 minutes. I got to be back at work. Do you? And then start looking at other people. Do you believe this? Do you believe that they have one person? No wonder why this bank is not profitable. I can't. What? what? There's two other tellers? Where? Hey. Hey, what are you two doing over there? Open up. How about risk? You'll like this one. Years ago, I was partners with somebody in a business. And he was at one end of the scale, and I'm at the other end of the scale. I won't tell you which end I'm at here, direct or indirect. You'll have to guess that. But we would go to our CPA to file our corporate income taxes. He's a risk avoider. I'm a risk taker. And we would always start it off by, you know, bringing in all our records and everything. He's the one who kept the records, all organized. He would say to our CPA, Ed, if there's a 1% chance that the IRS would disallow this deduction, I don't want to take it. Then Ed would look at me. Hey, Ed, if there's a 1% chance, I can justify it. Put it down. So, where would you put yourself on this scale? Most of the time with most people, would you say you're more indirect, an A or a B, or more direct, a C or a D? Pick a letter that you believe reflects your pattern of behavior most of the time with most people. And then I'm going to ask you a simple question here. How many of you chose as your number a one or a two combined with a C or a D? Can I see your hands, please? A one or a two combined with a C or a D? All right, your style is what we call the director. I'll tell you something about yourself in just a minute. Hold on, one minute. How many of you, a three or a four, combined with a C or a D? Can I see your hands, please? All right, our socializers, party on. Yeah, party on. Hey, how about a three or a four, but an A or a B? Can I see your hands, please, our relators? How you doing, Sue? Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Having a good time? Great. And how about a one or a two combined with an A or a B? Can I see your hands, please? Our thinkers. Now, they raise their hands a little slower because all the facts aren't in yet. <laughs> They're still analyzing this. Jury's out. All right. Let me give you a quick CNN overview of each of the four styles so that you can get a good feel of what each style is like if you are, in fact, that style. But even more importantly, get a good feel for each style if you have to work or live with that style. Because all of us, every single one of us, comes across each of these four styles possibly every day. So we need to understand what makes them tick. One more time, where are my directors? Directors. All right, their key desire, results, bottom line, their motto. I want it done right, I want it done now, or better yet, I want it done when? Yesterday. They're in a hurry for everything. Tend to juggle a lot of things at the same time and do them well. They're great administrators, delegators. They work best under pressure, under deadlines, and they play to win. Another motto for directors, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. You will rarely, if ever, see a director playing a game for funsies. Oh, let's not keep score. Yeah. Forget about it. I'll tell you this. They always want to know, what's the score? What's, what do they have? How much far ahead are we? How behind? I mean, they're always competing. I will tell you this. Of all four styles, directors are the weakest listeners. Now, let me repeat that for them. <laughs> directors are the weakest listeners, but there's a reason. They don't have time, 
And they already know the answer. Why listen? Let's talk a little bit about what directors do best. Three simple things. They create a sense of urgency for everything and everyone around them to come to closure on things. They figure out what needs to be done, and they either delegate it or do it. But even when they delegate it, they're looking over your shoulder. Hey, no, no, that's not the way to do it. But I'll tell you this. They are great at ensuring bottom line results. They get things done. Now, what's their problem? What's hard for them? They don't like to do things over and over again. When something has to be done over and over again, that's what they delegate to people. They uh, don't like a lot of rules and regulations because that kind of hems them in. And they're not very good at being diplomatic. They tend to come across as blunt. Where are my thinkers? Thinkers. All right, their key desire, order, accuracy, precision, perfection. Their motto, everything in its place and a place for everything. Their patron saint, Sergeant Joe Friday from Dragnet. Just the facts. Just the facts. They're the great planners, problem solvers, organizers. They're great at creating systems. They're highly inventive people. And of all four styles, arguably the most intellectual. Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Einstein, thinker. So I'll tell you this, without a doubt and without a hesitation, if you really need something done right, give it to a thinker. But if you need something done on time, think again. <laughs> because they procrastinate until it's what? Perfect. So let's talk about what they do best. What they do best is organize things. They fine tune things until it's perfect and they're great at planning. What's hard for them is working with people who are unpredictable or working in environments that are disorganized. They do not like that. They don't like incomplete or unclear directions or they don't like questions that don't have an absolute correct answer. That's why you seldom will see them in the social sciences. You'll see them in the exact sciences. Where are my relators? Relators. Their key desire? Harmony. <laughs> Safety, security, close one-to-one -one relationships. Do you feel me? <laughs> they are the true people people, one-on-one -on -one people people, loyal, reliable, team players, the glue, the glue that holds a team or a relationship together. Show me a marriage where one of the spouses is a relator and I will show you a long marriage. Not necessarily happy, but long. I'll tell you this, by far the best listeners because they have so much empathy. When you're excited, they get excited about it. When you're upset, they cry with you, or even for you. Problem area is relators do not like conflict. They do not like to rock the boat. And as a result, they tend to go along with things even when they really don't want to, because they don't want to upset the apple cart, so to speak. But let me tell you something, even when they go along with something, and on the outside it looks like they're in agreement, inside they're not. They resent you for even asking. They won't tell you, but when they get out of your sight, they'll pull out their little book, turn to the page with your name on it, and add yet another check mark. What do they do well? Well, I already said, harmony. They gr are great at harmony. They're natural facilitators, especially in groups. And they're great at any type of coordinating and cooperating with others. But what's difficult for them, what's hard for them, is competition. They hate competition. They hate working with dictatorial people. And they do not like even constructive feedback. See, constructive feedback sometimes come across, comes across to them as criticism. Now, they may see it as positive criticism, but it's criticism nonetheless. And finally, our socializers, where are you? And you can just hear them. 
You know, it's, it's really, it's interesting to watch even how the groups, the different styles, raise their hands. It's, it's amazing. The directors, watch this, directors. Almost like, yeah, okay. The thinkers. The relators. Right. The socializers. Socializers, their key desire, fun, excitement, applause, visibility, recognition. And as a result, they talk a lot about their favorite subject, themselves. Generally speaking, socializers are generally speaking. They have the gift of gab, the power of persuasion, the ability to get other people more excited about their ideas than even they are themselves. The only group who could win an argument not knowing what they're talking about. <laughs> Tell you what they're not good at, details. Why? What is this crossing a T and dotting an, dotting an I? Who cares about T's and I's? As long as it's close enough, that's all that matters. What do they do best? They're very inspirational people. They get people excited, upbeat about things. They think fast on their feet. And they're great at promoting things. They're great promoters. A problem area for them, what's hard for them, is basically any type of restriction, any type of routine. They do not like to be doing the same thing over and over and over again. They don't like formal reports. Hey, you want me to go out and do my job, or do you want me to do a report? I can't do both. And they don't like to redo something once it's already been done. Every style does things differently. In school, I say socializers don't like to redo something once it's already been done. Let's go back to term papers. Do you remember those things? How many of you have children in school that have to do term papers? You'll see this. When a term paper is assigned, first person to start work on a term paper is what style? The thinker. The thinker says, I have this many days. It's this many pages. I have to do this much work each day. I have to do it in this order. They plan the whole thing out. So by the time the paper is due, probably the day before, it is done. The day it's assigned. The relators look to put a group of people together so that we can do it together. Let's do it as a group paper. The director. I'll give you $20 if you do this. <laughs> 25 my last offer. Take it or leave it. The socializers. The night before it's, do it's due, they say, hey, oh, I got a paper due tomorrow, and they just do it. How about the monthly checking account statement? Do you think each style would handle that event differently? The day it comes in, the mail, do you think they would handle that differently? The day it comes in, who will balance it that day to the penny no matter how long it takes? The thinker. The director, again, is looking for somebody to delegate it to. The relators. The day it comes in, they wait for that evening to balance it as a family bonding experience. <laughs> The socializers, they look at it. Why do I keep getting this? Throw it in a box. How can I be overdrawn? I still have checks left. <laughs> Has anybody in here ever had to do that very uncomfortable task of firing somebody? Anybody have to do that? Because each style handles it differently. Each style. Who would have the easiest time? The director. Here's how the director does it. Sue, come on in. Hey, don't bother sitting down. I mean, boom, it's over. The thinker. Sue, please come in. Please have a seat. Uh, in front of you are two folders. 
On the left is all of the goals and objectives that we had for you that you agreed on. To the right is your performance. And I want you to know the standard deviation between, I mean, going into all the specifics, documentation, everything. The relator. Relators, by the way, have the hardest time. They cannot fire somebody. Here's what they do. Here's what they do. Hey, Sue, how you doing? Come on and sit down. Hey, how's the family? How are things going? Everything fine? Hey, listen, Sue, I was just wondering, how's your job going? That good. No, 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 I was just curious. I, no, I was just curious. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming in. Dials the phone, calls a director. Hey, you handle Sue. <laughs> Sue, come on in. Terminations are never pleasant. How about the socializer? Talk about inspirational, right? Hey, Sue! Hey, come on in. I got great news for you. I got a new job for you. Not here. <laughs> oh, boy. Every style does things differently. So, here's your quick quiz. Not only do they do things differently, they buy things differently. Knowing what you know so far about a socializer, what they're like, and they were to buy a car that truly matched their behavior, where somebody would say, hey, that's you, that is you, what would the ideal vehicle be for a socializer? A Corvette, a convertible, what color? You got it, there it is. Oh, I love that car, a Ferrari. And by the way, why is it that socializers, more than any other style, love convertibles? No matter where they, they live, they love convertibles. Because when they're at stoplights, they can talk to people. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, how you doing? Ideal vehicle. Or a relator. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bring the kids, please. Bring the kids. We have plenty of room. Ideal vehicle for a thinker. This is a new one. A hybrid. It makes sense. It makes sense. But you won't get this one. The vehicle for a director, then get out of my way. No nonsense. Yeah. Hey, how do you like their horn? Boom! Actually, this is the real vehicle. Yeah. You always wondered who, who was in these Hummers. Boy, notice that grill on the front. That's to push all the other cars out of the way. All right, let's talk a little bit about adaptability. This is absolutely crucial, adaptability. Two key things, two key things. Let me just uh, put the, the styles in here because it's easier for me to describe it. Here is a simple but yet incredibly effective way to be adaptable with people. And by the way, adaptability is the platinum rule in practice. Adaptability is changing your approach, changing your strategy depending on the situation of the person you're dealing with. So, with the two styles to the left, relators and thinkers, slow down your pace. With the two styles to the right, directors, socializers, speed up your pace. Two styles up top, build the relationship first, talk to them, socialize with them before you get down to business. And with the two styles at the bottom, the thinkers and directors, get right down to business. Now listen, here's a key. Get right down to business, get right to the task at hand, focus on the goal, and do not attempt to develop the relationship unless they initiate it. If they don't initiate it, it is all business. Make sense? I gotta tell you, I wish I knew this concept when I was in school. It would have helped me with uh, my, my friends. It would have helped me, most importantly, with the teachers. But in grad school, in grad school at the University of Connecticut, would have helped me with this woman. It would have. See, I, I was at the University of Connecticut. At the time, I was living in Brooklyn, New York. 
Yeah, Brooklyn, Bensonhurst, all Italian neighborhood. I met this student at the University of Connecticut. She was from New London, Connecticut. Now, if you look at a map, look at a map, and look at where Brooklyn is, look at where New London is, and as the crow flies across Long Island Sound, that little body of water, I thought we were like neighbors. It really is that close. I was wrong. See, New England has a very different regional culture than New York. Would you agree to that? See, New London is part of Connecticut. Connecticut part of New England. New England very different than New York. Although Connecticut touches New York, it doesn't want to. Uh-uh. Well, not only did we have this big regional difference in our behavior, but even more importantly, we had a big ethnic difference. Me, of course, a New York Italian. You know what they're like. She, English and Dutch. Now, I didn't realize how big a gap that was until after we were married. <laughs> First family reunion on her side of the family. It was in Vermont. I had never been to Vermont before. And I could not believe my eyes. Here were parents and children, cousins, uncles, aunts, all relatives, many of them not having seen each other for months, if not years. And how were they greeting each other? Shaking hands. What is this shaking hands? You know what I'm like. I tried to hug some people. They were like this. But in all fairness, it was a bigger, bigger, bigger culture shock for her at my family reunion in Brooklyn. Because how did everybody greet there? Hugs and what? Hugs and kisses. Okay, okay. Sometimes they took advantage of it, but that's another story. <laughs> when her parents wanted to come visit us, again, another culture shock for me. They actually called to see if they could come. Now, the Italians know what I'm talking about, right? They called, and I, I said to her, what are they calling for? She said they wanted to make sure that they wouldn't be inconveniencing us. Family? Now, when my parents wanted to come visit, the doorbell rang, and there they were. That's the way we do things. I got to tell you, my ex-wife had a very difficult time with that. Very, very difficult. Yeah, I wish I knew this stuff when I was younger. And I'm going to give you a couple of very quick things. Those of you who are attempting to take notes, believe me, you will not be able to. I'm going to go through this quickly. But at the very end of my presentation, you're going to see a slide up here. Right at the top, big letters, will be my email address. And if you simply send me an email, I'll send you all these slides double. There will be several more that will get into other things that we just can't cover in an hour. So let's talk about... If you are the director, what you need to do to come across more effective, practice active listening, be more patient and sensitive and empathic. If you come to any decisions, tell people why you came to the decision because directors have a tendency to be unilateral about things. And compliment other people. Here's the irony. Directors think compliments, they don't verbalize them. In fact, one of the few times you will hear a director say, well done, is when they order a steak. If you are dealing with a director, find out what their goals are and do everything to support those goals. Be prepared, be businesslike, be fast. If you're asking them to make any kind of decision, give them options with an analysis, all on a single page. And if they have any problems, respond quickly and effectively to their problems. With thinkers, if you are a thinker, here's what you need to do. Openly show appreciation. And sometimes try shortcuts, because sometimes they only do things a particular way. We've always done it this way. So uh, adjust more readily if there's change or disorganization. And make decisions quicker. If you're dealing with a thinker, what I want you to do is Cut out the social talk and the small talk unless they initiate it. And if you're going to ask them to make any kind of decision, give them some logical options, all the options with all the data and documentation that go along with those options. Give them time to think or sleep on it. 
And if you promise anything, you better deliver on it because they will hold you to every verbal, written, or implied promise. If you are a relator, here's what you need to do to come across more effective, to be more adaptable. Say no to people. You can actually say no to people without hurting their feelings. Take some risks. Stretch beyond your comfort zone. Delegate a little bit more to others and accept changes in procedures. If you're dealing with relators or managing or communicating with them, listen. Actively listen to them. That's probably the single most important thing you can do. If there's any solutions you're providing to them, show them how it, whatever it is, how it provides stability and reduces risks and impacts all the people who are affected by that decision or solution or change. Uh, they like guidance. They need guidance and direction and one-on-one -on -one personal assurances and good, personal, predictable follow-through. If you are a socializer, control your time, control your emotions, uh, spend more time checking and organizing things and verifying things. Whenever you have an agreement, follow through on the agreement. One of the problems that socializers have is they think out loud. Hey, you know, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. People go away, they come back uh, several days later and say, okay, I did my part, did you do yours? Socializer says, do what? And the reason is socializers tend to brainstorm and think out loud, and other people take it as actual decisions or commitments. So here is a very significant thing for socializers. If you are brainstorming and thinking out loud, inform the person. Now, I'm not making any commitments here. I'm just kind of thinking out loud so it won't get you in trouble. And complete more of what you start. Socializers get bored quickly. If something doesn't come to completion fast enough, they move on to something else. If you're dealing with a socializer, show more animation and enthusiasm. Make them look good in the eyes of others, especially their boss or their spouse if it's personal. Summarize in writing who is to do what, when, where, how, and why, because of what I said earlier. And save them effort and complication. If things have to be filled out, you do it for them. All right, one more quiz, ladies and gentlemen. This is the last quiz. This is actually the last slide. So, we picked the car for each style. Let's pick the song. The song that captures the essence of who they are and how they go about doing what they do. What would you say is the ideal song chosen by over 90% of all directors? Ideal song for a thinker. Thing is, I never hear a song. I, I typically hear a title of a song that doesn't even have lyrics, you know, like jazz or patriotic or, number one, classical. I love classical music. You know why? It's precise. Listen to this. It's accurate. It's even mathematical. Love that. Ideal song for a relator. They typically pick songs like Feelings or People. People who need people are the luckiest people, really, in the whole world. You've got a friend. We are family. But I'll tell you what they love. They love songs where they can sing in a group arms around each other, swaying back and forth. Songs like Kumbaya, or the modern version of Kumbaya, right? We are the world. What about the Come on. We are the children. We are the ones who make a brother and so that's our An ideal song for a socializer. Okay, see up top there? 
That's my email address, ta at alessandra.com. Notice Alessandra spelled with one L and two S's, alessandra.com. If you simply send me an email, I will send you a set of these slides, an expanded set of the slides. Now, here's the key. Please, because I do several of these talks and different talks, I don't do the same talk to every audience, in the subject line, put APA so I know that I'm sending you the right slides. Now, one last thing. If you are a director or a thinker, when you send me the email, all you need to do is put APA in the subject line. That's it. I'll know what to do. <laughs> Bottom line. If you are a socializer or a relator, put APA in the subject line. But send me a message, please. I'll read it. I really will. So anyway, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.